All right, so the webinar is being recorded um, and it will be available um, both on the CDSS caregiver support webinar um, and also the CAC webinar web pages. Um, like Jennifer said, if you would like a certificate for attendance today, um, please email your request to info at caregivers.org. Um, and then all participants today um, will not have the ability to speak, um, but you do have a Q&A section um, on the toolbar, toolbar, which is the um, icon with the three dots, and it should give you um, the option to ask questions. Next. So this is um, our agenda for today. Um, Jennifer is going to be giving um, a caregiver perspective. Um, I'll be going over um, child abuse prevention, intervention, and treatment. And then Sharon will end it for us with um, some great coping, school, coping skills that you guys will be able to use um, with the children that you are caring for. Next. And the next we have Jennifer and she is going to give you the caregiver perspective. Um, again, we um, we're excited about this, um, a spotlight on child abuse awareness and prevention um, and Order of Child Abuse um, Prevention Month. And um, I know that caregivers are really the front line of, um, of addressing um, child abuse intervention. And so we thank all of you for, for coming and doing the work of caring for children um, in need of pre prevent or protection because of abuse and neglect. Um, and so really caregivers are the ones on the front front lines doing a lot of this work. Um, and I think there, um, there are some great strategies um, that you um, may or may not know about um, to use as you're um, caring for youth in your care. Um, we're also um, excited to kind of learn more about what what the community is doing, what resources and intervention are in the community, especially in light of some new legislation um, that was passed and some prevention planning and work that um, all communities around um, the state and even the countries are involved in with the um, Families for Services Prevention Act. So a real, um, a real focus and um, an effort to bring more prevention services to families so that children don't enter the child welfare system. Thanks, Jaylena. Thank you, Jennifer. All right, so since it is um, National Child Abuse Prevention Awareness Month, we did want to highlight uh, an, an office within um, the Department of Social Services, which is the Office of Child Abuse Prevention. Um, the vision of the office um, is to develop an integrated statewide system that supports families to provide safe, stable, nurturing relationships and environments for their children, um, natural, adopted, foster, um, and guardianships. The mission of um, the OCAP is to shape policy and practice to, to promote the safety and well being of California's children and their families. Um, so, this is the information um, where they're located, and also the phone number, just in case you guys had any direct questions. Um, or um, in need of resource materials, um, this is a, a great resource for you guys. Next. How does California state law define, define child abuse? 
Um, the California state law defines child abuse as willfully inflicting cruel or inhumane physical punishment or any traumatic injury on a child. And that is from the California Penal Code 273D subsection A. And this is just um, some good information um, just to have in your resources. Go ahead and next. Child abuse is more than just bruises, marks, and broken bones. Um, there are many types of child abuse, but the most common types um, that we see uh, in child abuse are physical, emotional, psychological, sexual, and neglect. The presence uh, of a single sign doesn't prove child abuse is occurring in a family, um, but it is important um, to just be aware of it. Um, take a closer look at the situation, um, especially when these, these signs appear um, repeatedly or in combination with each other. Um, warning signs of child abuse um, specifically Physical abuse um, is when a child is hit, slapped, beaten, burned, or otherwise physically harmed purposely. Other forms of, of abuse, usually physical abuse, um, continues for a long time. Um, some warning signs um, that you should be aware of are frequent injuries or unexplained bruises, welts or cuts. Um, if a child shies away from touch, flinches at sudden movements, or seems afraid to go home would be some warning signs. For emotional and the psychological abuse is when a child is regularly, regularly threatened, yelled at, humiliated, ignored, blamed, or otherwise emotionally mistreated, making fun of a child, name calling, uh, always finding fault um, with a child are additional forms of emotional um, or psychological abuse. Uh, and some of the warning signs would be excessively withdrawn, fearful, anxious, uh, worried about doing something wrong, uh, shows extremes in behaviors, um, and doesn't seem to be attached to the parent would also be some, some warning signs to look for. For sexual abuse is when a child engages in sexual situations with an adult or an older child. Uh, sometimes this means direct sexual contact, uh, such as intercourse or other genital contact or touching. Um, but it can also mean that the child is made to watch the sexual acts, uh, look at adult genitalia, uh, look at pornography or part of the production of a por pornography. Um, children many times are not forced into um, sexual situations, but rather persuaded, bribed, tricked, or coerced. Uh, some warning signs um, to look for um, could be um, trouble walking or sitting, um, displays knowledge or interest in sexual acts um, inappropriate um, to his or her age, uh, or even seductive behavior making strong efforts to avoid a specific person um, without an obvious reason. Um, neglect is when a child's basic needs are not being met. Some of those warning signs can look like lack of nutritious food, adequate shelter, clothing, um, cleanliness, emotional support, love and affection, um, education, safety, supervision, um, and medical and dental care. The framework for child abuse prevention. Um, all of the materials um, that we do have um, for this webinar, including the PowerPoint, will all be emailed to everyone after the presentation. Um, so, if you guys want a copy of any of the materials, I will have 
um, all of that for you guys um, emailed at the end of the presentation. Um, so to achieve the vision um, of the Office of Child Abuse Prevention, um, they have adapted um, a healthcare model for, present, for prevention, um, which is seeking to build protective factors through community um, and natural supports while uh, mitigating risk factors. Um, in the framework um, that you can see, um, there are three levels and three strategies um, for the prevention of child abuse um, and the promoting of healthy families. Um, for the purpose of this webinar, we are not going to go into um, each of these different levels um, in depth, um, but I am going to go over some of the protective factors um, that came out of these three different levels. So the protective factors approach to the prevention of child maltreatment um, focuses on positive ways to engage families by em emphasizing their strengths and what is going well. Um, as well as identifying areas where uh, families may need additional support um, to reach their full potential. So you'll see um, for number one, um, it is nurturing and attachment. Um, infant brains develop best when caregivers work to understand and meet the infant's needs for love, affection, um, and stimulation. Number two, um, knowledge of parenting and child development. Uh, parents who understand child development are more likely to provide their children with respectful communication, uh, developmentally appropriate um, limits, and opportunities that promote independence. Number three, which is parental resilience. Resilience is the flexibility and inner strength to bounce back when things are tough and knowing how to seek help in challenging times. Number four, social connections. Parents often find it easier to care for their children and themselves when they have a network of emotionally supportive friends, families, neighbors, and communities. Number five, concrete supports for parents. When your family's basic needs for food, clothing, housing, transportation are being met, you have more time and energy to devote to your children's safety and well being. And then the last one, which is the social and emotional competence of children. Children's ability to self regulate their emotions and their behaviors. Um, communicate their feelings and solve problems effectively um, positively impact impacts their relationship with adults and their peers, um, including their family. For child abuse intervention, um, for those of you who aren't familiar, um, there is a mandated reporter training. It is free um, on mandatedreporter.ca.com. Um, and this training is extremely helpful. Um, not only at the end will you be um, a mandated reporter, but it helps with um, teaching you on how to identify um, signs of children who are um, potentially being abused. Um, it tells you resources, who to contact, um, different things that, that you can do. So it's a great resource. We highly recommend taking that training. Um, so if, um, you have an opportunity sometime today or within the next couple of days um, to look at that website. Um, and like I said, that training is free. There is also a child help hotline um, you can do a live chat, you can call, you can text, uh, and with that hotline, um, you can speak to somebody directly, you can tell them the situation, um, what you've observed, um, kind of why 
um, you suspect child abuse, um, and they will actually help you facilitate um, on the steps to take next. Um, and then I will also um, provide you guys a list um, with specific county um, agencies um, that take the report for child abuse um, and their telephone numbers. So you will have all of that um, as well at the end of this presentation. For some treatment options, um, treatment can help both children and parents in abuse situations. The first priority is always to ensure the health and safety uh, and protection for the children who have been abused. Um, ongoing treatment focuses on preventing future abuse and reducing the long term psychological and physical consequences of abuse. Um, the first step in a treatment option. Um, is medical care. If necessary, um, you should always seek um, appropriate med medical care. Um, seeking uh, immediate medical attention um, if the child has signs of any physical injuries um, or change in consciousness um, and follow up care with a health uh, provider may be required. The second treatment option um, that we are going to go over, which isn't just limited to these two, um, but the the most popular one um, is going to be talking with a mental health professional. Uh, talking with a mental health professional uh, can help a child who has been abu abused learn to trust again. Can teach a child about healthy behaviors and relationships. Teach a child conflict management and boost self esteem. Um, other different types of um, therapies that may be effective, um, such as trauma focused uh, cognitive behavior therapy, um, also known as CBT, um, which CBT helps a child who has been abused to better manage uh, de stressing feelings and to deal with the trauma related memories. Um, eventually, the supportive parent who has not abused the child um, and the child are seen together so that the child can tell the parent exactly what happened. Um, so that pat particular type of therapy uh, kind of walks um, hand in hand with the healing process. Um, the child parent um, psychotherapy, uh, this treatment focuses on improving the parent child relationship and building a stronger attachment between the two. Some other psychotherapies um, that can also be helpful to parents um, is, di is discovering the, the root cause of the abuse, uh, learning effective ways to cope with life's unavoidable frustrations, um, and also learning healthy parenting strategies. Uh, children who are placed in foster care uh, may need mental health services and social services will schedule home visits and make sure um, essential needs um, such as food um, are available to them. Some additional ways um, to help provide um, support. Um, and this, these are going to be, um, tangible for you all, um, which is the 1st 1 is providing structure and daily routines. Uh, civility is going to be super important. Um, um, for the healing process, uh, giving attention to support the child's emotional, uh, physical safety being present. Um, is really important. Um, I know a lot of times um, with dealing with children who have been abused, sometimes we don't know how um, to support them. We don't know how to be there, uh, but just being present does make a huge difference. Provide a safety plan. 
um, know what to do in an emergency, um, know who to talk to, um, where to go, um, being prepared um, is also something that you want to make sure. Um, so just having a list of, of go-tos. Listen to when they want to talk. Um, it's important not to force um, children to talk about their traumatic experience when they're not ready. Um, but like I said earlier, just being present um, and ready for when they are ready to talk about it. And then the last one, consistently demonstrate and remind them you are there for them. It is important um, to remind them that you are there for them, not just physically, but also emotionally and without judgment. Um, and I'm really excited now um, to get into um, the coping skills portion of this webinar, um, which is gonna probably be um, the most tangible um, that you'll be able to use from today's webinar. So I am going to introduce Sharon um, and then she is gonna go over the coping skills for you guys today. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome, welcome. My name is Sharon Hildebrand. I am the director of ACASA program, which stands for Court Appointed Special Advocates. Most of you work or live or care for children in counties that have CASA programs. We are independent organizations that work for the judges, the juvenile judges in our county. We train volunteers who then are the voice for the youth that you support and take care of in court. Most of the time uh, we are assigned the hardest uh, cases and we wish that we had a volunteer for every single child in foster care. That's our goal on both the state and nationwide effort. So if you know of anybody who wants to volunteer, you can contact your local CASA office. Uh, today I get to talk about coping skills. Uh, I've been with my program for going on 23 years. And one of the things that I mandate our uh, employees to do is every single one of us have to carry cases so that we can know how to make recommendations to support the children that we are serving. And right now, uh, caregivers are, you are some of the most important people in the system because we don't have enough of you. So we wish that we could have a home, a foster home for every single one of our youth. Oftentimes, some of our more troubled youth are placed in what used to be called group homes, now called short-term residential treatment programs. So the nurturing and family focus that you can offer in a family home is needing to be supported by what we call coping skills. So if you could move that slide one. Uh, one of the things I want to emphasize is, is that coping skills aren't just for the children that we take care of or that the courts put in our care. Um, they're for everybody. So in order to take care of anybody, you must take care of yourself. It's called self-care. And uh, these coping skills work great for everybody. All right. Uh, learn them. Learn what works for you. Learn what works for each of your children. So they can be used to manage stress or um, an embarrassing situation uh, just about any time. And we teach our kids to understand and we bring up virtually on a daily basis what coping skills work for you. So we use this one word and we also ask, especially in our schools, when we're working with our youth for individualized education programs, which are also called IEPs, we ask them to refer to these behavioral supports in their IEPs as coping skills. And oftentimes you have youth that you're serving and taking care of that have behavior plans. So if we're all on the same page, we all call them the same thing, it is less confusing to the youth that we serve. But for the sake of talking today, uh, there are many of them and I will have not included everything here, but it's a good start and you may all have coping skills that you use 
in order to take a deep breath in the morning, get up and be that parent, go to work and uh, be able to support your entire family, which includes the foster youth that you're taking care of. Um, I know my family thinks I'm crazy. I like to iron. And, um, and or I remember one day in a training, somebody said, why are you watching all of those shows like Law and Order or uh, NCIS? And there was a reason that sometimes we watch those because the good guys usually win in the end. And so it brings to um, closure. And oftentimes that's what we're looking for. So there are, everybody has different coping skills. Uh, remember that it is positive coping skills help you get through the situations. And oftentimes our children have very poor coping skills because they come from families that didn't know how to use these. So they provide short term relief. We want to steer our youth and the other support members of the team that support our youth like teachers to um, consistently provide positive coping skills and to make sure to help the child understand what are poor coping skills. So here's a, an example of some of them. And it's my understanding you're gonna be able to have and all these slides. At the same time, I did provide a digital coping skills book that you can copy pages out of. It's all different ages um, to use in your home. Please feel free to share it later on when you get it and you can use it at school if you happen to be a teacher. But some of the good coping skills, you know, positive self-talk. Um, when we were growing up, there was no such word as can't, okay? It's, it's an easy one to tell our kids. There is no such word as can't. You can do anything you put your mind to, okay? Deep breathing, great skill, but we don't want the kids to hyperventilate. So we tell them to close their eyes and we breathe in to the count of three slow and out to the count of three slow. This is a good one for you and I. Um, oftentimes in what we do and who we work with, we may want to react and say something. Sometimes I gotta breathe a lot before I say something. So it's a good one to teach our kids. Um, taking a shower, you know, is oftentimes going for a walk. Oftentimes in the school settings, one of the um, things that we can work with the schools is if our youth's having a bad day, that they be allowed to go walk the track, okay? Or go outside with support and walk. Oftentimes this is a really good coping skill. Um, doing something creative. A lot of our kids love to do the, um, the coloring books, the really, especially our teenagers. So you can go online and Amazon, just make sure they're appropriate. Um, we usually buy the animal ones or the flower ones and we send them um, the coloring pencils and they really like to do the adult coloring books. It's a very good um, coping skill for them to just hyper-focus on that and it calms them down, okay? Exercising, I bet a lot of us do that. Um, talking to a friend, that's a support system. You, in order to take care of our youth, have a support system, use that support system. If you need to talk, give them a call. Uh, playing a sport or game, we don't get enough of our kids into after school sports. Uh, swimming is especially good. And, it, and especially swimming, just to let you know, is especially good if you have an autistic child. Um, the going under the water, and remember when we all went to the beach and we put shells up to our ears and we heard that sound? That is a very calming sound to an autistic youth. And underwater, that's the sound you hear. So we do find uh, it was very interesting on the teams when we were coaching when we were younger that our autistic kids were able to start and do a 25 yards completely under the water until we finally figured out why. It's because it was very soothing to them to be underwater the entire time, all right? Um, hanging out with friends, uh, as much as there might be some uh, negatives to that sometimes, our kids need those social connections. And socializing, just like you may need to talk to a friend, they also need to talk to a friend, okay? Taking a time out, we do that with our little ones. And um, it's just a time to sit and talk. Sometimes those timeouts, if they're not working, we can, uh, you know, hand them a book to look at, especially if they're younger or if they, you know, we have a lot of sensory toys. Um, 
there's a lot of different things that you can use for coping skills. These are by no means all of them. Now, some of the poor things. How many times has your teenager come home, you got a phone call from the school and they got into a fight and then you look at them and say, what do I always say to you? And your teenager looks at you because believe it or not, they do listen to you and they say, walk away. I said, yes. Okay. So oftentimes they react, they don't think, and they use these poor coping skills, name calling, insulting, becoming violent, um, threatening, doing something dangerous. And one of the reasons this slide may be helpful if you're talking and working with a teen in the home is most of our kids are very visual nowadays. Uh, we all are visual. Think of how much time we spend on our phones or on our computers, okay? We're all very visual. So oftentimes just talking to them about what they should or should not do or what are good skills and poor skills, it might be beneficial for you to show them this and they get it if they can see it. It's a, a you know visual to brain and they'll figure it out. But isolating that avoiding family and friends, that's never a good coping skill. Oftentimes I bet the kids that you work with do that quite a lot. And again, this is not an all-inclusive list. You can add it to your own list about what works and what doesn't work. Next slide, please. What is stress? Um, I'm pretty sure none of you have ever had any stress, right? Uh, we just got done, well, not even done with it yet, about two years of stress. And it stress is a um, issue that affects us both emotionally and physically. So what happens when you have stress? And you know, stress could mean that you're stuck in traffic. You're supposed to be at a 5 p.m. meeting. It's now 5.15. It doesn't look like you're gonna get there anytime soon, okay? So your blood pressure raises, your heartbeat raises, you release a lot of cortisol. That's the ugly stress hormone, okay? And you then start reacting to that. Our kids do the same thing. Um, you know, we have too many things going on. We try to put too many things on our plate. Um, our kids, one of the things that we should be helping them to understand is, you know what, make a list and make, don't try to give yourself 10 goals. I don't know about you, but if I put 10 things I'm going to get done on my list today, pretty sure I'm going to fail because I'm going to get stuck doing one of them and I'm not going to get to four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. So when you're establishing goals for yourself and or your youth in order to reduce stress, make it accomplishable and such that it can get done. You know what? And make sure that they understand that that's successful when you can get those certain things done. A lot of our kids, especially our older teens that are over 18, you may have an AB12 or what's also called a non-minor dependent in your home. Oftentimes we have to help them learn life skills in order to be adults that are able to give back to society and able to support themselves. Sometimes they need lists. Uh, um, this morning, the example was, uh, I, uh, and I oftentimes our youth wanna only talk to us by text. That's fine, just get used to it. Um, so I texted the youth, I said, you need to get up and go to school today. And the actual the reaction was, I'm sick. I said, and we had that discussion. I said, then fine, I'm gonna send you videos and you're gonna study for your um, driver's permit. And she responded, okay. I got a call within 15 minutes um, saying, and I said, well, it doesn't sound like you're too sick to me. She says, no, I'm on my way to school. So oftentimes if we give them a short list uh, that they can accomplish, and then um, praise them for doing those things, it lessens the stress. But don't be afraid to give a to-do list to some of our youth. Let them do it themselves. They have to fail sometimes in order to move forward. But the opportunity to, not all of them come from any type of background where they were able to understand what, I, what do I need to do in order to move forward? Okay, that's what we're here to is to help them. Here's some common stressors, you know, um, problems in relationships, grades, watching the news. Now, as you read some of these common stressors, 
do we all understand that our families that you may be working with, including the children who ha are now put in your care, they are impacted by these stressors even worse than you do because they're starting stressed out. And then if you add these things, you're gonna be even more stressed out. It's kind of like a score sheet. If you have resilience and you had some positive upbringing and you have supports from family, you start at a higher score than, of course, a lot of the children that we take care of where they haven't had these supports. So another stress upon where they're coming into the system is going to stress them out more. As long as you understand that, okay, you can work with them to help them understand that this could, you know, these things that you're feeling in your body could be caused by stress. They, there's some physical changes for you. Headaches, pounding heartbeat, sweating, trouble breathing, shaky. Um, they don't realize it, but a lot of times their blood pressure raises, their heartbeat races, they feel it shaking. And they have not been given the skills or been brought up in families where they understand how to deal with this stress. You know, can you imagine how stressed a child is, even if they're two? one or two, and they're hearing a lot of screaming in a home because there's a domestic violence situation. That impacts them and impacts their brain development. And we, as a society, a community, and a family taking care of those children, it will come out later, okay? So we need to help everybody that we touch with coping skills. So how do you cope with those stresses? Um, focus on what you can control. You know, what's inside of what I can control versus what's outside, okay? If you can control um, that, you know, I'm going to pick you up at five, we're going to go have some dinner, we're going to come home, you know, you're going to do your homework, that's controllable versus um, you can't control what that other child is saying about you, nor know what that child is going to tell somebody else. So you be in charge of yourself and it will lessen the stress if you only understand i can only control this you know time management our um you know a lot of our kids don't even know how to tell time they look at their digital watch or something and so you know making a schedule and posting a schedule in your home for it to be visual and to be shared by all is sometimes very helpful because they get into a routine and they know to expect it and it lessens the stress as opposed to wondering, I'm wondering if I'm having dinner tonight. Now, I wanna also emphasize that every single one of you have probably had a placement that comes late at night and you don't know a lot about that youth. Understand that that youth, um, every time they move brings stressors because they now don't know what to expect in the new home. Um, visual reminders and visual rules are very helpful whatever home at least they can sometimes they're afraid to ask you know are we going to have dinner um, but if it's posted and or on Saturday you know we we have family time here and then we go and do some activities they can maybe not feel so um, hesitant to ask about it if it's posted uh, taking care of your body a lot of our kids come from families where all they, they've been fed a lot of soda, they've been fed a lot of sugars, um, candy, very easy fast food. That has um, impacted our youth's physical uh, ability to cope with stress. So oftentimes good diets, vitamins, ask your foster care provider if you can please support your youth with vitamins. They're missing out on a lot of those things. We've processed a lot of vitamins that contribute to the support of our body's handling stress like vitamin d okay on uh, the vitamin b's and you know that's the simple multivitamin we're talking about that may be helpful too and then um, getting exercise um, some of our kids because of how they've grown up and the stress and or genetics could be have uh, physical ailments like diabetes a lot of these shaking and sweating and things like that could also be being triggered uh, genetically and they could be having pre-diabetic episodes. So be aware that, you know, to question these types of things. Um, positive self-thought, 
How many times have you been working on a project yourself and you're thinking, oh gosh, I'm done with this. Okay. Instead it's, I can do this. Let's finish it up. I can do this. And then you're so, you know, you're proud of yourself for getting it done and you can go on to the next thing. We need to tell our youth that too. Okay. And we always need to encourage them to understand that we all care about them. And this is part of your team and that they should feel comfortable talking about their feelings uh, to a, an adult that they trust. And so sometimes that means identifying, especially at school. Um, don't be afraid when you identify or you talk about an adult that you can talk to. Always put a name to that. Be black and white. You can talk to Mr. James. You can go talk to Mrs. Smith and those type of things at home too. Um, identify who they can talk to. And we can also get permission if the child has uh, other adults that are outside the home or other friends. Um, I know the social workers are really good about allowing or giving out information so that they can talk to those support people outside of the homes. Next slide, please. Um, this is just a visual of how stress impacts you. And you know, it's gonna instruct your, uh, impact your body, your mind, your behavior and your emotions. So, um, and again, uh, you have to take care of yourself before you can take care of anybody else. I'm guessing that you've all experienced some of these things and our children do too, okay? Um, when they learn how to deal with the stress with positive coping skills, which it's everybody's job to share with them and teach them and to also be consistent. So these positive coping skills, if you get a child in your home, absolutely make sure you communicate with the social worker and or the school of that new child as to what coping skills were working previously, okay? Um, a lot of our children have sensory issues in that they, I want you to picture that brain, that, that meme that we saw all the time where you had a, um, all of the mechanical things going on and they were all going on at once. A lot of our kids have sensory issues. They just can't deal with loud noises. Uh, they can't deal with a lot of pictures. Yeah. Kindergarten teachers, uh, if you remember going in and they've got so excited, brand new kindergarten teacher, they go into their classroom and they put up all these great pictures and things like that. And then you have the little boy that comes in and he absolutely closes down, goes into a fetal position and can't deal with it. That is a big indicator that that little boy has some sensory issues and he's going to need some um, calm areas. A lot of our schools now actually have rooms where the kids can go and calm down. Also, um, some of my kids, if we identify that they have sensory issues, one of the accommodations we ask for both at the school and they can help at home are the um, sound, they, earphones and they don't hear a lot of those sounds, which means they can just focus right here on what they're doing because they're not having and trying to deal with what am I hearing versus what am I seeing, et cetera. So understands those are stressors um, from our kids and a lot of it deals from their abuse and neglect as they were growing up, okay? Their brain remembers certain things. Next slide, please. So these are my last slides. Um, by no means are you going to know or understand all the potential coping skills, but these are some fun ones. Um, if you can get your kids involved in anything art, anything dance, um, a lot of our teenagers in communities, they actually have um, art opportunities where they can go and just freely do art. A lot of our kids, uh, that is very soothing to them, especially our teenagers. Dance, a lot of the kids. Um, we also have a couple of programs where our first responders in the morning run the tracks at school. You know, they have to do their PT frequently, our first responders, uh, for their jobs. And so we asked and they were fine with, um, especially a number of our older kids, 
running with them. And we found that especially at the first start of the day, calming the kids down with exercise was really working well. You know, if you have a first responder friend or somebody who likes to jog, it's a great opportunity to involve that youth. And it then becomes a coping skill for them. The um, getting plenty of sleep. Um, OMG, one of the hardest things is our youth who take that phone to bed with them, okay? The, um, that, if you can, if you can turn off your Wi-Fi at night, I would do it, okay? Our kids staying up all night, then we're having problems getting them up in the morning uh, to go to school. They get cranky and they continue that cranky the entire day and then everybody else pays for them not sleeping. Uh, it's one of the hardest things to deal with with our youth is taking those phones or devices to bed. Um, I know plenty of foster parents and uh, short-term residential treatment programs that turn the Wi-Fi off at night. And they have rules and phone contracts with the youth, which you can work out with your social workers too, okay? It's important that they get a lot of sleep. I don't know about you, but if I don't get enough street sleep, it is, um, it's going to be a bad day at work, okay? Um, playing with animals. If you don't have a pet in the home, um, oftentimes we get our kids involved at volunteering at humane societies because animals uh, if in an appropriate setting, if the youth is being watched and supervised, can be very, very relaxing. Just, and it also teaches empathy for the kids. You know, um, there's a lot of other things. I did put a different one for coping skills for teens. They seem to uh, think that they don't have to do a lot of these things. I can't emphasize enough though, that if a youth is, has an IEP, individualized education plan at school, make sure the coping skills that work at home are shared with the teachers at school so that we can all be on the same page. Also make sure that in any IEP goals or plans, behavior plans, that the word coping skills are used because our kids, we identify and label things differently all the time. We use a lot of acronyms. Make sure you spell out the acronyms for the kids. They don't know what they mean. And, um, but identify and share, you know, if the child is in therapy, ask the therapist, what coping skills are working? Do you find working? Make sure you do those at home, okay? Make sure you share them with the school and everybody should be on the same page. So we're all using the same coping skill directive for that youth and they take it with it. Now, most of our kids are very good about when you look at them and say, what coping skill works for you the best? And oftentimes we ask them to name your top three, okay? So we have them identify. Um, a lot of kids uh, read. They can go off, they can be in a quiet room and they read. That's a great coping skill if you can encourage that one, okay? Especially for our teenagers, they might be able to get school credit for that too. So again, I have provided a digital toolbox, um, coping skills that Janine is going to email out to each of you. Feel free to copy it. It's meant to be copied. So save it on your desktop and download page by page. And um, my email is there too, if you have any other questions. And I really thank all of you for what you do because um, you were desperately needed and we appreciate it. Thank you, Sharon. That was a lot of great tools. Um, so we appreciate you being able to be with us today and provide all of that. That was awesome. Um, if you guys have any questions, um, go ahead and put it in um, the Q&A portion. Um, we do have um, several people available. Unfortunately, you're not going to be able to raise your hand and ask a question for this webinar. So all questions will be addressed um, in the chat. Um, so if you have any questions, go ahead and do that. Um, and while I'll give you guys an opportunity to do that, I will go over the resources that I am gonna email you guys um, at the end of this webinar. Um, Jasmine, if you don't mind going to the next slide, um, that way I'll just give everybody an opportunity um, to put their questions in the chat if they have any. 
Um, so I am going to um, be emailing you guys um, a copy of this PowerPoint. Um, I will give you guys a copy of the coping skills toolkit um, that Sharon talked about, um, as well as the um, specific coping skills for the kids and the teens PDF. Um, I'll give you a copy of the framework for child abuse prevention and strategies, um, the protective factors umbrella, um, a prevention resource guide um, for this year um, that was written um, by the Office of Child Abuse um, Prevention. Um, there is a resource parent guide um, that's in there that is um, that we created um, last year. Super, super helpful. A lot of great resource information in there for you guys. Um, there's a California Kinship Navigator flyer in there. Um, if you guys um, need any assistance, um, any resources, um, that California uh, Kinship Navigator, uh, you can speak to somebody live um, via chat, text, um, call, or email, um, and they are super, super responsive. Um, and then also um, a um, a first flyer, uh, which is the family urgent response um, flyer. Um, so if you guys need any assistance immediately, um, you can contact our first unit. Um, and they even have, um, depending on the situation, uh, even a, a mobile team as well. Um, and right now I will pass it over to my colleague, Salima, um, and she will be doing the Q and A portion of the webinar. Thank you. So far, we have two questions in the chat. Um, the first one is asking: Is emotional abuse considered in daycare also with the instructors? Um, so, Jay Lennon, did you want to respond to this question? Yeah, sorry. Can you can you repeat it one more time for me, Selena? Selena, yes. I'm sorry. Is emotional abuse considered in daycare also with the instructors? And it looks like they are specifically asking um, about yelling. That is a great question. Um, we do have a community care licensing division um, that we can get them in contact with to go over the specifics um, since that's not our area of expertise, which is the community care licensing. Um, so I, you can give me that contact information, Salima, and I can make sure I get them over to the community care licensing division and speak with someone over there. Definitely will do. The next question is, what are recommendations to us to get a team that is resistant to other activities except for staying in the room on a phone despite encouragement and recommendations to do other activities? And that's from Vernita. Um, Sharon, would you like to respond to that? Sure. Um, I'm gonna take a wild guess that this is a team and um, we do phone contracts and the i think that there's probably um you know there is a hesitation by everybody to take a phone away from somebody um remember that they only must have access to a phone to call you know their their um, attorney their social worker uh other people that they might have access to but we often do phone contracts with them. Now, if it's uh, problematic at home, it's also problematic at school. So if you are not the ed rights holder, I would absolutely coordinate with them and to coordinate this. But always, even teens, uh, you know what? Offer a reward. This is what you're going to get, and we're going to work on this. Um, but I would do a phone contract with them. I also happen to know that many, many strips and short-term residential treatment programs I get mad at everybody if they use acronyms, so I tried not to do it myself, but um, they turn off the Wi-Fi at a certain time, and most of these phones are Wi-Fi phones. And so 
Um, it is an opportunity for you. I know that a lot of caregivers have been successful in doing that and uh, inviting the youth to participate in a certain activity at night. It could be, uh, you know, a game time or, you know, I'm not beyond bribing for reading books, but um, I would do a phone contract. And there's lots of examples of phone contracts. Um, I'm guessing you can ask your social worker. If you don't, I'm happy to also send Jaylena a couple examples. I, I have some strategies that I know a lot of caregivers use as well. Um, <clears throat> we have uh, uh, many caregivers will have, um, it, it could be a um, a landline phone that the youth is is always able to use or or even some type of cell phone that that is always available but you know maybe the smartphone you know for example is is off or is in a in a charging location that's outside of the use room you know during nighttime hours and then carving out time you know like we don't have a household rule we don't you know, have our phones with us during dinner or during, you know, game night or during some family activity um, and, and just carving out those, carving out some phone free t time, you know, but yet, so that would be phone free time that they don't have their smartphones um, or maybe they don't have their smartphone until they're, you know, finished with their homework. Um, but yet they al they always have access to the landline or to some kind of a cell phone that doesn't have all the smartphone features. Yes. Thank you, Sharon and Jen. I think that um, also answered the question from Ben. Um, he was asking what, let's see, if there was a way to limit site access when the Wi-Fi is on. Um, so I do believe you guys answered those questions. We do have another question that just came in. Um, how do I handle a child that when disciplined always uses the I have rights argument to try to get out of trouble? And um, for this, for this situation, um, I would suggest that if you have a moment to talk to the social worker with the child, or if the child is in therapy, um, use a session to help create the rules and the consequences. So the child is aware, you are aware, and you guys sign a contract. Like Sharon says, contracts are always a great thing for families. That way everyone knows what's going to happen um, after or when something happens. So those are the ideas that I can give. Jen or Sharon, do you guys have any other ideas that would be helpful to Megan? I, um, you know, one of the hardest things about working with the children that we all do is, is that what they hear and what somebody says to them is often different. So um, the issue about foster youth rights, yes, there exists foster youth rights. I would say that a lot of times they're misunderstood, especially by the youth, because they're going to hear something different than what maybe somebody is explaining. They are, one of the things that we have found very, very helpful is um, if you've all experienced our CFTs, child and family team meetings, is prior to that child and family team meeting, all the adults get on the same page, meaning you meet for 10 minutes, then you bring the youth in. Um, the idea being is let's all get on the same page about what we're telling this youth and what we're expecting of this youth. So with the example of the phone, that we all get on the same page that we would like you to hand your phone over um, by 9 p.m. every night. It's important you get your sleep. It's for health reasons. And then we will hand the phone back to you um, prior to you going to school. However, you will be expected to not be on it at school as the uh, these are part of the adults. Remember, we're all talking and we're all on the same page. OK, so we have found that very, very helpful with if we, the adults all get on the same page. 
so that you don't have one of the adults sending wrong information. I think also um, this is a great conversation or maybe a time to um, to talk about boundaries, which I think our our kids and our our kids need um, training on boundaries, you know, for the rest of their lives. We all do um, how to um, keep themselves safe in in relationships and situations and how, you know, the there are rules in the house to kind of protect everyone's boundaries and everyone's rights to safety and so on. And so, um, you know, reviewing the foster youth bill of rights and kind of just talking about some of the, you know, what the rights mean for the youth and what the, what the rules, you know, mean for the family to, to keep everyone, um, everyone's rights and safety and boundaries in place is, is really important. Um, and could could maybe potentially lead to a kind of a a teaching um, a teaching situation, um, maybe not in the heat of the moment because I know kids don't like to hear a lot of words and talking if they're if they're really hot or or fired up about something. But maybe um, at the end of the conflict or you know prior to in a situation um, maybe before. A conflict is is likely to occur. Um, having that conversation may be helpful. Thank you for that, Jen. Okay, let's see. Um, I'm sorry, we're having. A couple of questions in the chat, but unfortunately, um, the information that you guys are requesting cannot be provided by any of the panelists. Those are um, out of everyone's expertise that are on the panel today. So that is something that may be able to be offered when we go over special educational rights and state mandates. But um, for this particular webinar, that is something that we cannot address. I apologize, Joy. And at this time, I am seeing no other questions. Um, if you do have any other questions, please feel free to go ahead and put it in the chat now. You're welcome, Lucy. And like Jay Lena said, all of the information and the following resources you guys will receive. I know we have several people that dialed in on the phone and cannot see anything, but the webinar will be posted on CDSS web page for the caregivers and also on CAC site. So please look for that. You will receive an email with all of the information also. Jalen, I'm seeing no other questions at this time, so I'm handing it back over to you. Thank you, Salima. Just wanna go over um, just some more resources for you guys. Um, again, this will all be provided to you guys, um, but there is a, a foster youth ombudsman, um, some information on legal resources for foster youth and families, um, free online therapy uh, for current and former foster youth of all ages, um, the family urgent response uh, system, the FERS, um, I will link the website for them. Um, I know somebody did also ask um, for the contact information for the Office of Child Abuse Prevention. I will link that for you guys. Um, and I will also link the California Kinship Navigator as well. So this is just some information on the caregiver support webinar. Um, if you have any questions, um, 
in regards to this webinar um, or future webinars, uh, please feel free to email us at caregiverwebinar at dss.ca.gov. Um, this is also the link to our website um, where all of the um, webinars will be posted um, as well as some information um, on future webinars. Um, and then if you have any specific foster care, foster caregiver policy um, or support questions, um, you can email our unit directly at caregiversforyouth at dss.ca.gov. Um, again, just want to remind everybody um, before we end the webinar um, that if you are in need um, of a certificate, uh, please make sure that you email CAC. Um, I will make sure I will get her a list of the attendees for today. Um, but just want to thank everybody for uh, taking the time out to join our webinar. Um, want to thank Sharon um, for providing um, the portion on the coping skills, uh, which I know is um, very important, um, but it was a lot of great information. So thank you, Sharon. Um, and thank you, Jennifer. Uh, for giving us the caregiver perspective. Um, we appreciate your partnership. Um, and just remind everybody, uh, our next caregiver support webinar, uh, the tentative date is slated for Thursday, May 18th, um, at the same time, one to three. Um, everybody who attended today will get a direct, a direct link to register. So be on the lookout for that. Um, but if you have any other questions, um, you can email us directly at the caregiver webinar. Um, and that is it. So I'll hang out for a little bit just in case any more questions come through. But thank you everyone for attending today. We appreciate your time and we hope everybody has a great rest of your day and happy Friday.